And our uh, last uh, speaker for uh, this morning's sessions is uh, Mark Stein, who's a professor of psychiatry at the University of Washington School of Medicine, also a psychiatrist at Seattle Children's and the principal investigator in the Center for Child Health, Behavior, and Development. He received his PhD in clinical psychology from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, and he's speaking to us today on the CTSA Research Ethics Consultation Project on Data Sharing. Mark Mark, welcome back. Thanks. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. It's uh, great to be back here. Uh, I was a faculty member for 12 years um, and a fellow last year, and uh, this always feels like home. Um, <clears throat> I just want to acknowledge uh, uh, help for this talk uh, from my, my new colleague, Ben Wilfond, at uh, Seattle Children's. <clears throat> I'm glad I had a disclosure slide. Um, um, I do uh, clinical research in ADHD, and these are some of my relationships. Um, I'm going to talk about my experience with research ethics consultation and give, in, give you an overview of this project um, and some of the early results <clears throat> in 15 minutes. I guess to start, um, um, a little bit about my history. Um, I started at UIC in 2005 and I had a great deal of difficulty um, <clears throat> transferring some of my research grants and clinical trials. And I became very frustrated with um, <clears throat> the IRB process and contracts. Um, and as a result of my frustration, uh, they asked me to head a task force uh, as to how to improve the, this for investigators. Um, at the same time, there was the movement uh, to develop uh, clinical and translational science centers. Um, UIC uh, applied for one. Oh, great. Thank you. And uh, we were funded in 2009. And what I did was um, direct the regulatory core. And my focus coming in as an investigator was really to support investigators um, and was really focused on investigators and subjects. We had an external review um, in 2010. And it was right after this survey was conducted which um, talked about the roles that C CTSAs had in terms of uh, research ethics consultation. The majority of CTSAs had, um, a CT has a, had a research ethics consultation service, but they were highly variable in terms of how busy they were. Um, and they differed in terms of their approaches to confidentiality uh, toward the investigators, toward the studies. So not surprisingly, um, the um, external review committee that came that year said, how come you don't have a research ethics consultation service? So this was something that hadn't occurred to us um, when we were designing the, uh, the core. So um, I um, um, immediately emailed uh, Dr. Ross <laughs> um, and uh, Dr. Siegler, and we developed a collaborative um, program where we um, implemented a research ethics consultation service uh, that was kind of an emerging program where UIC's uh, program would provide clinical supervision and backup for the research ethics consultation service. Uh, at that time, um, I also began inquiring as to if I could become a fellow so that I could get training in, um, in, in clinical and research ethics, which I then did the next year. <clears throat> So just to review a little bit about research ethics consultations, um, this is a relatively new area. Um, you know, some of the milestones, again, first use of the term was here, uh, following the, the studies of pediatric liver transplants uh, in the Singer et al. Um, article. And another major milestone was the CTSA program, as we just talked about. Um, you can also think about different studies that instigated the need for research ethics consultation services and where they are on this timeline. So what is a research ethics uh, consultation 
Um, there are different definitions. Uh, this is one that Besco um, had. Um, <clears throat> I think the important point is that it occur, can occur at any point through the life cycle of a study, um, and it can involve uh, many different stakeholders, you know, researchers, IRBs, um, sponsors. So uh, this is a slide that Ben developed, and it sort of um, uses a parallel of research ethics consultations to clinical uh, ethics consultations. Um, you know, the main difference is the role of the IRB, and the dotted line is, you know, due to the um, confidentiality in terms of it's not a, a strict line, um, although it varies from institution to institution how that goes. So, um, in, in general, uh, consultation services are very general. They serve uh, diverse clients. Um, the topics are extremely broad. And uh, they, they provide an in-depth discussion um, of fine-grade con concerns that often is not available to investigators or to IRBs. And as our science is getting better, there are more and more um, unresolved issues. You know, how do you, how do you address um, uh, new frontiers? So um, again, there are, there are multiple stakeholders, um, and it varies by um, uh, program. At some places, many of the referrals come from IRBs, whereas at others, um, they hardly ever come from the IRBs. Um, the questions are also extremely variable, uh, from first in human studies, phase one trials, um, risk of harm, um, and studies, again, that there really is no consensus. Um, you know, issues like uh, incidental findings in uh, genomic research or neuroimaging research. So one of the, um, one of the uh, goals of the CTSA um, <clears throat> was to learn more about research ethics uh, consultations. And um, under Ben's um, guidance, uh, they, the project was started to systematically gather data on research ethics consultation services. Uh, the idea was to get standard information from each program and to be able to share it and then to develop a system that we could evaluate um, its effectiveness. <clears throat> After uh, numerous phone conferences, this was the form we developed. Uh, and then I say we, this is a steering committee uh, of people from 11 different sites. And there's a lot of discussion about what level of detail we should provide on the research ethics uh, consult. Um, so um, this, we wanted it to be something that would be fairly efficient and easy for the investigator to enter, uh, and something that would be helpful, um, again, for, for evaluating the project. So looking at you know, what type of research activity, what stage the study is in, what's the primary ethical concern, um, that actually was hard to do because oftentimes you look at one area and then you, you, you find out that there's another uh, question. Um, so secondary ethical concerns. And then some of the mechanics, how much time was spent, how many people were involved. So this is the, the volume data from two, tw 2012, and what you can see is there's a huge variation. Um, you know, NIH um, you know, is, is the busiest center, um, and for many centers, um, there were fewer than five. Um, our year uh, at UIC, we had three that year. And I was really embarrassed to report that we only had three, and it was kind of reassuring to see this data that we weren't that much behind um, uh, other places. Looking at the type of research ethics consults, um, they were done in all stages of research, but um, I think this is a very positive thing. Um, looking at the planning stage was um, one of the most, most common areas. Also in terms of a translational phase, um, from, it occurred from T1 through T4. Um, looking at what the primary ethical concerns were, really heterogeneous um, group of reasons. Uh, the largest was informed consent issues, 22%, um, but you can see um, benefit risk assessment is another uh, area.
In terms of categories, the research ethics consults were done on a wide range of categories. Um, pediatric populations were, uh, was um, uh, the highest. So um, taking a step back and kind of looking at this process, um, what have we learned? Um, well, uh, there's still questions in terms of how you measure research ethics consults. The, the quality is extremely variable, but how do you measure quality? Um, who should be the research ethics consults, consultants? Uh, what training should be required? Um, uh, one of the interesting things at UIC, we only had three research ethics um, consults, but we had 12 different consultants. And so, was, and actually, four of them had um, been fellows at the McLean Center. So, um, I think the advantage of having more consultants is you're more likely to have people whose expertise overlaps with the consulting consult question. But also, the more people you have, the more meetings, the more time, and you know, you really don't want this to be another barrier. Um, how do you measure the quality of advice? Uh, which which stakeholder do you ask? The investigator, the IRB. Um, and the acceptability of the concept of research ethics consultation varies by institution. Um, you know, science is very competitive. Um, some people, some places really emphasize speed and getting it done and may not want to share information, especially if, if that slows things down. Um, <clears throat> as an investigator, you know, you're very reluctant to add steps to what is already a large regulatory process. Um, I'm on an IRB now, and um, I was um, going to ask for a research ethics cons consult, and um, I was surprised that people were saying, well, you may not need that because we have this person that does that. Um, so again, it, it varies, the culture varies with the IRB in terms of their acceptability of this. And again, you know, how do we, me how do we measure it? I mean, I think this is a good first step in terms of developing this form. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of work to be done um, on the psychometric properties of the, of the measure, but more the, most importantly, the validity of the measure. Utilization, just counting number of, of ethics consults, I'm not sure that's really optimal. Um, uh, ratings, again, it depends on which stakeholder in terms of how they viewed it, uh, but certainly investigators being satisfied with it I think is very important. Um, publications are good that you can count it. And um, <clears throat> I like the idea that Dr. Siegler suggested yesterday that we should count the number of lawsuits. And if we can reduce lawsuits by doing more research ethics consults, that would be a very good thing. Um, one of the thorny issues, again, is the confidentiality um, you know, that you promise the, the, um, the investigator, um, especially if you're going to participate in a, um, a project like this where you're sharing information. Different consult services have different uh, degrees of confidentiality and how they explain it. Um, you know, the biggest concern is, is if there's extreme misconduct or harm that needs to be reported. So um, in summary, the, the main issues is the volume is highly variable between institutions. And again, we don't know, is low use good, reflecting fewer uh, ethical research dilemmas uh, and learning from the past? or bad in terms of people being reluctant to utilize what could be a very valuable service. One of the um, uh, projects that uh, the steering committee developed was an online forum for research ethics uh, consultations. So people at different sites could post different questions and get response in a blind fashion online. I mean, it was a great idea, but no one used it. Uh, and we thought it would be used. Um, so you know, why is that? Um, is it we don't have good PR for this or, or what? One of the, the uh, new concepts is to develop a national rec service for any CTSA so that you can provide a standardized service, um, protect confidentiality, and ensure, ensure some uniformity in terms of training. And again, as I, um, I just talked about, how do you measure the effectiveness? One of the major benefits, I think, of the research ethics consultation service is a secondary effect, and that's uh, education of colleagues. Um, as soon as we started the ethics consultation service at UIC, um, we had a dramatic increase in grand rounds on research ethics um, issues, um, more people interested in getting training, more, more people interested in reading about it. 
Um, so I think figuring out a way to measure the secondary educational effects is really important. And then, you know, looking at the overall goals of the CTSA, are we really share, by sharing experiences, are we building on each other's experiences and increasing our knowledge, um, or are we still working in silos? And, you know, what can we do to enhance that? And I think that's, that's the next step and the next deliberations. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, Mark. If you're willing, despite your voice, to take a question or two, we'll see. Yes. Yeah. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. I'm wondering. I guess my personal view is I think there should be separation uh, because you want to encourage investigators to use it first in the planning stages. And uh, I just think that, that that takes down a major barrier. But I guess one of the unresolved questions is what to do after the consultation is done in terms of. Uh, and some, some institutions do give feedback to the IRBs, some don't. So it varies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, let's uh, thank our panel.